You're listening to Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim, a podcast dedicated to the private lending industry. I'm Kevin Kim, and my goal is to sit down with key figures in the private lending industry to talk about their business and their personal lives. We'll get their takes on market conditions, the industry at large, and their personal stories. Overall, I really want to learn more about how they started and grew their businesses. So whether you're a lender, a borrower, a vendor, an investor, or anyone just interested in learning more about private lending, this podcast is definitely for you. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy this week's episode of Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. This episode is sponsored by PrivateLenderLink.com, where investors and brokers find direct private lending companies throughout the United States. Are you struggling to find the right lender for your deals? Private Lender Link offers a unique service to provide private lender recommendations. Over the past 10 years, they have established relationships with many reputable direct lenders and know each company's guidelines. Their platform makes the process to get recommendations very easy. Simply provide details about your loan request by filling out a short questionnaire. A lender link professional will review the information and invite a few select lenders to view your loan request. The lenders will reach out to you directly to further discuss the deal and provide a quote. Save yourself a lot of time and effort by leveraging private lender links knowledge, relationships, and 10 plus years in the industry. Their network includes lenders for commercial real estate, residential investment properties, and small businesses. To get started, visit privatelenderlink.com and click the big green button at the top. All right, guys, welcome to a live episode. We are in the offices, the headquarters of Parkview Financial up here in West LA with my friend, Paul. Thank you so much, so much for doing this interview today with us uh, for this episode of Lender Lounge with yours truly, Kevin Kim. We we love it when we get to come and visit offices because yeah. it's just so cool. I have to say, you guys have the most beautifully decorated office I've ever seen. <laughs> the art, the view all these cool features, the bar. I mean, it's it's amazing. This is amazing. So thank you for thank joining you. us today. Yeah, uh, thanks for coming. For our listeners who don't know who you are, uh, you know, I, I think we've known each other for a long time and you've, I mean, the firm and your company have been kind of friends or client attorney relationship for almost over 10 years. Correct. But I'd I like you to kind of give us an intro of who you are and the company and we can go from there. Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, Paul Rahimian, Parkview Financial. Uh, I, I'm a third generation real estate developer and contractor prior to Parkview. I had a, I had a different life in construction. Uh, my father and I, we used to build projects in Southern California. Mm -hmm. We built schools and hospitals for public work projects. And then at the same time, we built development projects for ourselves, Mm -hmm. like multifamily and retail, Mm -hmm. uh, 2008 hit, uh, we put everything on hold Mm -hmm. Uh, and interesting, my, my father's a very quiet, relaxed individual, mm-hmm. came into my office one day in 2009. He was all nervous. He said, we're not doing anything. Mm-hmm. So what do you want to do? The world's coming to an end. Right. And he said, why don't we lend money? I said, we don't know anything about lending. We're builders. He said, we'll give, decided, right? yeah, he said, we'll give money to contractors and developers. Banks aren't doing it. And we've got money sitting in the bank. Let's do it. So that, that's how we started. And we, we started with our own money for a few years. And then we ended up putting a fund together, raising investor money. And that's how we've this grown is over when? the This is back in 08? This is in 09. Yeah, so 09. at the height of just, yeah, the world is ending. Right. Especially, you were in LA still at the time. We were in LA, yeah. I mean, LA was just bonkers. Yeah. Everything was, no one knew what was going to happen. Buildings were shuttering. I remember because I was in law school in LA. Yeah. And it was like. 09 was when we really felt it. I yeah. remember it was like at my law school, they basically said, if you're a transactional attorney, which I was, going to be a transactional attorney, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, nobody was transacting. Nobody no, wanted to buy. Said, nobody wanted to build. No, my nothing. professors were like, go do litigation because you're not going to find a job right. doing what you want to do. Right. And we remember like downtown LA was a ghost town yeah. and Koreatown was a ghost town and it was started getting really scary. But that kind of, fear was an opportunity, that kind of crisis was an opportunity for you guys. Right. We were lucky. We weren't leveraged. We had learned our lesson in 1991 Mm -hmm. where we were leveraged. Mm -hmm. Uh, First building we developed, my father and I together, we lost to the bank. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was 18. Great lesson to learn Mm -hmm. when you're young. And And back in the 90s, the leverage ratios were high. They were high. And 91 was a really bad recession. Not as bad as 08. But in terms of California, it was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And that's where we learned that 
Leverage is good during the good times. Leverage is horrible during the bad right. times. Be cautious. So we Be got lucky cautious. in 08. We weren't leveraged. It gave us the opportunity to pivot and do something else. When you started out in 09, were you doing what, what was called back then hard money lending? Or pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. Yeah, it was hard money lending, half a million, million dollar right. small loan. Somebody's building a house. Somebody's building a four-unit apartment building. Right. Really small projects, projects that we were managing ourselves. Right. Just my father and I, no so, team. So tell the audience a little bit about what Parkview Financial does today because it's sure. a very different asset. It's a very lending different. business yeah. than the true hard money lender back in 09. 08 yeah. of doing the fix and flips and the rehabs and the construction loans on the resi or the small multi. Yeah. Now you guys are, I mean, pretty well known, at least in, on the West Coast, for being some of the most, being the most, in it, I, well, this is this is the, this is what I've heard from a lot of my real estate clients. Oh, can you ask me, Kevin, can you introduce me to any lenders? Well, who do you work with? Well, well uh, who do you want? Who do you want? Who do you know? Like, oh, well, like, we know Parkview. We know Paul. We know these guys. We know those. Guys. Oh, Parkview. They're pretty creative. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they that's what we're known for. for. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we've we've changed over the years, and you know, credit goes to our team. We've got a great team that we've built over the years, and creativity is one of the big right. words we use right. because we'll literally sit around the conference table on a Monday morning when we do our pipeline mm -hmm. uh, meetings, going through every deal in the portfolio, mm -hmm. and we literally say, "How do we make this work? Right. Let's figure out a way to make it work for us, mm -hmm. where we're safe, our investors are safe." Right. But the borrower gets the funds they need. They build the project. You got to be creative, right. and it and it's a team project. It's not one guy. Right. We're all talking. We're all thinking. How do we do it? How do we make this structure work? We had an email go out yesterday on a very complicated project mm -hmm. that I think will happen. Mm -hmm. And if it does, it's actually a big project in uh, in LA. Mm -hmm. And talk about creativity and structure, there's 10 bullet points of how do we do this? How do we do that? Right. Make it work for the bar, for make it for us. Yeah. So give us an idea what that today for Parkview, what is kind of the core asset class, the core, core power base for unit today? Sure. So most of, most of our projects are multifamily or okay. mixed use project, okay. maybe re, uh, retail below, apartments okay. above or condos above. Okay. We also do office, industrial and retail, mm -hmm. but a lot of our portfolio is now multifamily. Is it, is it short term commercial bridge? or is it construction or is it all of the above? It's all of the above, but it's mostly primarily construction. That's construction. what we're known for. Yeah. So yeah. I, I've got the construction background. Right. We have an engineering team on staff. Right. We have five or six engineers. They look at drawings. They do site inspections. Right. So we have the ability to handle construction projects, 100, 200, 300 unit projects. Right. And that gives our borrowers the ease to mm -hmm. know that, hey, you're, you're talking to people that have done what you've done. Mm -hmm. We understand your pain. We're going to work with you. And then our investors, obviously, they understand that we know what's going on. Right, 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 right. And, and, and I want to talk about construction and the process in a bit, but I, I want to go back to the history of the company because sure. it's, it's very rare we get to interview folks that have, had, have been around since, like, I would say, basically the start of the concept of non-bank or private lending. It right. didn't really exist before 09. It was being done, but... It was being done on a small scale. Right. Talk about kind of the growth, the, the key key kind of milestones over the years, because from 09 till today, it's been a long run for you guys. Yeah. A lot yeah. of companies <laughs> didn't make it through the various... We had that blip in 16, we had 20, and then we have, we're, have, we're in the current kind of market volatility we're in today. You guys right. have really weather those storms and right. you continue to grow. So tell us about some of, the, some of the key milestones over the past few years as you guys have grown. Well, I actually think the market disruptions yeah. are opportunities for, for platforms like Parkview. Expand, you know, we were, yeah. we were created in 09 mm -hmm. during one of the worst recessions in the past 100 years. Right. And the reason we came into business is because there was a void. Right. And there was, there was an necessity for what we were right. going to provide. All the banks have stopped lending. Right. All yeah. the banks stopped lending. Even the private lenders were scared. No one did construction. No, nobody nobody wanted to do construction loans. Yeah. And I'll tell you a quick story. I, I, the, one of the first conferences I went to, I was sitting in the in the audience, and and uh, there, was a, there was a panel of banks there, Union Bank, Wells, and B of A, and all of them there. And uh, the organizer, you know, asked people in the audience to ask questions, and everybody said, who does construction loans? Everyone on the panel goes silent. Nobody's raising their hands. Right. And then the organizer says, who else has a question? So I raise my hand. And he comes to me and goes, what's your question? I go, I do construction loans. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is early, right? This is We've opened up three months. We've probably done two small loans no, of 200000 sure. And uh, 
the panel ends 10 minutes later. I get up right. and there's 40 people around me right. asking for my card. And that was the aha moment. Right. There, there's a volatility in the marketplace. There's a disruption. How do you fill that void? Mm. So we did that in 2009. Mm. And, and during the years, we grew very organically. Mm. We never had a plan. We never had a milestone. We never said mm. we're going to do this by this year or this by this date. Mm. It was just slow growth. And when we put the fund together and we raised the investor money, that really gave us the ability to do bigger loans, go bigger platforms. And when was, bigger what year GF. did you choose to do a fund? Uh, we started in 2015. Very early. Yeah, very, very early. early. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. 2019 is when we decided to go nationwide. And that was another 19? pivoting point. Yeah, right before COVID, probably six months before COVID. That was so from a commercial, <laughs> for commercial lenders, that's a little bit behind the trend because we started seeing that trends kick in around 17, right. 16, 17. What was the reason you guys decided to kind of wait on going national? So for us as a construction lender, yeah. and, and we'll talk about it, but going and seeing every site every month, it's very difficult to geographically say, heavy, yeah. I'm going to go lend in New York and Miami. Right. It's very resource heavy. Right. So we had to open offices. We had to hire a team in Atlanta. We had to do the right things to be able to truly lend right. nationwide. And now we do. And, and if you look at our map, you see we're lending. I think last year we lend in 38 states. Fantastic. And we're lending in places like New York and Miami at the same volume that we do in California. So mm -hmm. you see that we're truly... A nationwide and are you, are you going to site visitations? So that's the one thing they let me do is that I go see every uh, deal before we approve it. Once it's approved and it's closed, we have a construction team right. that does the monthly. But you're still going. But I go. Way. I was I was traveling uh, yesterday. I travel next week. I'm always traveling because I want to see every deal. I meet the borrowers, see the real estate. I actually run the comps. I go see mm. the comps and go look and and try to and try to evaluate. What's the true value of this project going to be when it's built? And you've always done that. I've always done that. The past now it's been what? And so you oh nine twenty about thirteen wow. years. Yeah, I've always done that. Years. Yeah, and and in oh nine I was doing everything that our team is doing sure, today. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> but as we've grown, they've taken things away from me, and they're doing it. Like I don't do originations at all anymore. Right. I stopped doing it about two, three years ago, and I used to do origination. Mm -hmm. So slowly things have been taken away from me and our team is just, they're so phenomenal. They do it right. better than I ever did. Of course. And so the one thing that I bring to the table, creativity, structure, underwriting, but also is the site inspections. Mm. So, which so, is key. Of course. You got to, you got to kick the tires. Real estate, you, this whole well, that's, Google earth. That's and this, lost in today's. It's lost. You know, it, with, with, you have this commoditization and even in the, you know, in the construction and the, and the bridge lending community in commercial, we started seeing a pretty significant commoditization. We started seeing the big banks come in. We started seeing Wall Street come in, you know, bonds and CLOs were happening for these short-term loans, not just the big CMBS deals. And what was fascinating was that we're, we saw the same phenomenon in Resi. We're like, they're, 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 they're doing these deals as if they're commodities, but construction is so, there's so many people involved in this project. Right. And especially today. When you're, you're, you're touching it constantly. Right. Right. We're not doing a bridge loan where we give money to somebody and say, see you in 12 months, 18 months, pay us off. Right. We're literally in communication with them all the time. Right. Right. They right, have right, draws. Right. They have construction. There's issues. Right. It's construction. I did it. Right. There's always problems. You got to be patient. You got to be flexible. You got to be able to pivot when there's an issue. So, so it's starting out as a basically father son business in 09. And yeah. today, t tell us about kind of the size of the, of the company now, volume sure. and origination now. Sure. So, um, Last year, we did $1.2 in uh, new originations. Fantastic. This year, uh, we're in September. We're close to a billion. So okay. we're probably going to either hit last year's number or likely surpass it. Okay. <clears throat> um, Team-wise, we're about 30 people now. Uh, very we have, lean. We have very lean. Yeah. For, for, the, for the amount of origination, we do very lean. Right. But at the same time, we're closing about 30 to 40 loans per year. Mm -hmm. uh, we're so seeing bigger about, deals. Yeah, we're seeing about 9,000 loan requests per year mm -hmm. and we're closing 30 to 40. So that shows you the funnel of how we're working through You're the system. You're saying no a lot. We're saying no a lot or they're saying no to us. <laughs> right. We give them our pricing and they say, no, thanks. We'll right. move on. Right. So it, it's a, it's a give and take, but mm -hmm. it is a lean team, but it is, it's bigger loan sizes. I think our average loan size is about 40 million right now. Okay. The earlier this year, we closed the $200 million loan. Mm -hmm. So we're doing bigger deal sizes. Uh, but it's truly a, a good team that works well together. We have mm. we have an origination team 
that's about eight people. We have an underwriting team that's about seven, eight people. We have a construction team that's about seven, eight people. These teams all work together, and but they, they touch work every with, deal. But they touch every single mm. deal, and that's the key. So, one of the questions I wanted to ask, and I asked the, I asked a lot of our, I asked a lot of our guests who do these bigger deals. How is there a difference for our, for our audience? How is there a big difference for how you approach these bigger deals, or the fundamentals and lock and tackling the same? Because you guys have done smaller deals, you guys started doing construction loans yeah. early on. They weren't that big. Now you're doing. 40, 50, 100 million, 200 million dollar deals. Right. How, how, how could you, how do you guys differentiate? So there's pros and cons. Right. Uh, you know, the, 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 one of the pros of going bigger is you're dealing with more sophisticated borrowers. Sure. Which makes the process easier. Right. Believe it or not, they're when prepared. you're doing a $500,000 deal, they, they're not as sophisticated. They don't know what to expect. You right. got to hold their hand right. through the process. When you do bigger deals, they're more sophisticated. Seasoned developer, right. they're coming, they've got counsel, they come, they got counsel, they're coming right. prepared. Yeah. And we, we like that. They right. come with their counsel, we come with ours. They know each other most of the right. time, and we let them do their thing. Right. Uh, I think the cons is you got to be concerned about market disruptions, right? We're right. going through a volatility right now. I call it a recalibration. Mm-hmm. We're really, it's becoming a new normal. We had a, we had a long run mm-hmm. where we had low interest rates, and a lot of us really believe low interest rates were going to be the way it was going to go forever. Wow. And now we're at this point where we're saying, we don't know. What did you think when you saw rates that low? We, a lot of people, and I, me included, thought this was a 20 to 30 year run. Really? Because when you look at interest rates over right. the past 60 to 80 years, you see that it goes up and down in 20 to 30 year runs. Mm, and the true. fact that we've only seen this truly low interest rate for the past 13, 14 years, mm. and it's going up, makes a lot of people think that it's temporary. It's going to go up. We're going to get rid of inflation, and then it'll come down again. Mm. But who knows? This right. could be the beginning of higher rates because right. if they can't get rid of inflation, there's a lot of people that think it's going to take a much more than just a couple rate hikes. Right. It's going to take 12 to 18 months of rate hikes to get it there. Then you might see yeah. higher rates for a long we time. We might be back to the rates that we saw in the 90s or the right. 80s. So that's, but, so that's the concern, right? You're right. going bigger. You're doing a fifty million dollar deal, more exposure to one asset. Right. That asset goes sideways because the borrower can't right. handle it, or the asset goes wrong, or something happens in that geography. Now you've got more exposure. I think that's one of the cons right. of going bigger. And have you found yourself kind of like I guess what do you call it? Uh, uh, tackling concentration risk because you guys are. You guys are still private. You guys have, don't have an institution behind you. You're still privately funded. That's correct. Through investors and various different sources. Right. How do you guys prov- how do you guys alleviate concentration risk on the books? Because it's, it's big loans. Right. 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 So we we do look at concentration on different levels. We look at geography. How yeah. much do we have in California and New York? Those two, are, those two compromise probably forty percent of our originations. Mm-hmm. About twenty percent each. That's one concentration. The other one is asset type. Mm -hmm. How much do we have in things like retail? We don't Mm -hmm. love it. Land, we don't love it. SFR, we don't love it. Mm -hmm. They're usually in the 2 to 4% range. We want multifamily to be at least 70%. And at times it's 80, 85%. Yeah. And then there's there's concentration risk with an individual borrower. Mm. We have a borrower right now that we have five deals with right now mm-hmm. that are closed and active construction. Mm-hmm. We've kind of hit that limit. Yeah, great borrower. We've had great success. Yeah, but he's, he's paid he us gets off. Hit by a bus. But if so, exactly. Yeah. So there is a little bit of risk, and then and then there's risk of of where you are ge- geographically in a specific market. So we're in L.A. We right. love Koreatown. We love doing deals there. How many deals do you do before you say it's too much? Right. We haven't seen that as much because we're so widespread nationwide, right. but we think about those things. I didn't know you guys did a lot of deals in K-Town. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Some of the Jameson properties. I guess. <laughs> Not Jameson's, but other ones. <laughs> I don't think they want to pay our rates. <laughs> yeah, I know about them. <laughs> I mean, so it, it, what, I'm, what I'm hearing, though, is, is through the growth, though, what's really interesting to me is that you guys have still kind of kept a – private mentality about things. Yeah. And you're going to do it your way. Yeah. And let me ask you this. During the past 13, 14 years now, there had to have been opportunities for, let's just call it a big Wall Street bank or a yeah. big institution to come knocking at your door. Right. And, you know, hey, we want to kind of effectively, the, the carrot they dangle is capital. Right. Right. But then the, the stick that comes with that carrot is, here are our asks, right? Right. I mean, right. Did that ever ha- did that opportunity ever come to your company? It has. It's, ha- it's happened multiple times. Yeah. 
uh, and, and there's different asks, right? right? When the asks, it's a monetary issue. Right. We're more okay with it right. because we'll, we're, we're, yeah, yeah. we'll give up we'll give up some money to to have a, a bigger bigger capital partner. Sure. The bigger issue is the the lack of control. So right. we have the ability to, like I said, sit around a room. We're eight underwriters, and we literally restructure the deal. Mm -hmm. And the credit committee is myself and my business partner, mm -hmm. and that's it. And my business partner defers to me on a lot of issues. So that ability to be creative and structure right. deals goes a long way. With bigger capital partners, that's one of the problems. So we have we have bigger capital partners, but it's fully at our discretion. So So the ask is always we need to maintain control over credit. We need decisions. to maintain control, yeah. And and that gives us the ability to be creative, right? right? It was the first thing you said when you sat down is Parkview's known to be creative and right. to and to pivot and to make deals work. Because we want to make deals work. We want to close deals. Right. We want to deploy money. The only thing we want to do is be safe for our investors. So right. as long as we can be safe and we can get you borrow what you need and get you where you need to be, there's a synergy. Let's talk about that now. So I want to talk about the construction, I guess, underwriting process, because a lot of people have, what's unfortunate about the market conditions today is that we've had this massive kind of run up. It's been great. Things have been hot. And that has led to a lot of companies taking on construction loans yeah. Like starting construction lending when they really shouldn't be. Yeah. So let's talk about the kind of the, like the, the I will call it the proper way to do a construction <laughs> loan. And then also talk about kind of how you guys get creative with a, with a situation that I, I actually would like a, if you can give us one, like a specific episode of like this came, this deal came to us like, Ugh, it's got a little hair on it, but we made, we actually figured it out. The bar made these combinations and we made it work. Like, right. And, and, and so like, if you can give our audience some intel on that, because I, I, ver I very rarely interview people that have a such a long background in construction lending in commercial. Yeah. Most folks that we're, we're talking to in commercial are doing a lot of bridge. Right. But what we noticed was starting in like 17, 18, we started seeing a lot of ground construction lenders come to the market. And a lot of them were not doing things very well. Right, so. right, right, right. And some of them aren't here anymore. Yeah. So please educate our well, audience. <laughs> I, I, think the, I think the key to construction lending, and, and it's probably the key to lending in general, is to not be greedy. Mm. We see, like I said, we see a lot of opportunities, right? right. Nine, 10,000 loan requests a year. And why do we close only 30, 40? Is because we're weeding out the deals that don't make sense for us mm -hmm. and the borrower. And by that, I mean, look at a deal that, A, is this a good deal to build? You'd be surprised how many projects are not viable projects, right. but people fall in love with it and they want to design it. Is it the right geography? Is it the right asset type? Mm. It might be a great corner for an office building, and now you're building retail, and that doesn't make sense. Mm. So those are the things, those are the initial things we right. look at real quick. And then in terms of construction, how long is it going to take you to build? How much is it going to cost you to build? Mm. And how much is it going to be worth? Mm. If it's going to be worth the less, <laughs> less than how much it's going to cost you to build, mm. then you have a broken project. You'd be surprised how, you, how often how you, we how see that. How do you that. kind of make those projections, though? It's hard. So, it's hard. so uh, underwriting can do valuations. That's it, easy. It's like right. any other bridge lender. You right. assume the building's built. What's the comps in the area? What you know? Right. It's multifamily. What are the rents? That's right. easy. You pick a cap rate. The hard part is how much does it cost to build? The borrower is telling us their projection. They have a general contractor. They have engineers. What we do at Parkview, and I think a lot of people do, but I think it's a little bit different, and we've done it from day one, is that we do all our estimating in-house. We use no so third-party vendor. Their, their estimates. No, we're doing our own estimates. So we oh. get their drawings, and we act like we're going to build it. We have estimators on staff. They're engineers, and they mm. literally take the drawings, and they build build out the project as if we were to build it. So they're running their own. Their own estimates yeah. down to the last nut. I mean, it's a detailed right. eight-page document. And then you're comparing that. We're comparing that. Yeah, and if yeah, it's yeah. close, great. If it's far, let's talk about it. Yeah. And if it's far on certain items, let's talk about it. Right, right, right. A lot right, of right. times projects fall on the sideways based on that. Yeah. We can't see eye to eye because we're not seeing this the right way. And it could be something simple. Very, very simple. Very simple. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so that's the number one thing. Once we see eye to eye and we have a budget that we like, borrower likes, everybody approves, we do another thing that's unconventional, none of the banks do, is that we never change the budget or the detailed line items. So you have a cost overrun in concrete, solve it. Mm. You have a cost savings in concrete. Great. Keep the money. We'll give you the money because we told you we would. So whatever line item we come up with, 
and we do it collectively with the bar. We how, are you, to, how are you monitoring that over, over so time? So we have construction managers, three throughout the country, mm-hmm. and they go see every project every month. Mm. And they're they're talking to the subcontractors. They're talking to the bar. They're visiting the site. Oh, they're meeting. They're meeting. Oh, they're on not site. requesting documents. No, they're no, meeting. no, no. Okay. on site. Okay. And they and they see the progress every month, and they see what's going on. Again, I think that's the key. It's what I did when it was just me and my father. We would li- I would literally go to the site, right. but it was only in L.A. Now that we've grown, we have to have offices. But that can the tires approach. Not a lot of people do. No, I don't I've know heard many. a lot of people don't do that. I, I don't know why. I think it's so simple and fundamental. Right. I think it's the right way to do construction lending. I think it's a, maybe it's a fear of, I've heard a, a, a couple questions about it. Like it's like, well, number one, I don't know if I can afford to do that because the borrower is fee sensitive. Right. And when you had such a hot environment, Fee sensitivity became such a big sure, topic. Sure, sure. And then the borrower doesn't pay for that. It, it, we pay for it through right. our overhead, okay. but we think it's worth it. Right. So it's part of your incurred expenses, yep. and you're willing to pay t- take that expense. I think that's a smart move because you're that one of the that there's no way to know f- through paperwork. There's no way to know. You can, fo- you can Photoshop any picture right now. Especially the contractors. Yeah, you, you never know. You, you know, I, I've told my team this. I've told borrowers it's no secret. I used to be in the construction business, right. and this is 15 years ago. Any invoice can be yeah forged. Yeah. Any any. A lien waiver can right. be forged. None of these documents mean right. anything. If you really want to know what's going on, you got to have boots on the ground and see but what's those going man- on. But those, those, those construction managers doing site visitations, they have to have a pretty seasoned background to be right. able to, hey, I'm seeing different brands of concrete you're using, or I'm seeing different types of steel that you're ordering. I'm seeing, like, this doesn't line up with what, what's on paper. 100%. Because you can't tell if you're not a seasoned pro. No. So our head of construction, he worked at Jacobs Engineering for 10 years. Wow. And, and he's well-versed. Right. He used to do public work projects just like I did, but from a different viewpoint. I was the mm. contractor. He was the construction manager. Mm. We didn't know each other, but that was his role. Mm. Our our head of our Atlanta office, also a construction manager that used to have a 90-person team. So he has the ability to understand construction. He knows what to see and what not to see. Mm-hmm. And, and remember, we're the lender. We're, we're, not, we're not directing them how to build it. Right. We're just saying, we want to know what you've done right. and how much money you've spent and what your percentage of completion is. Mm. If you're 50% done with concrete, we have a concrete line at him, here's your money. If you're 100% done, here's your money. Did you pay your subs? Show us your lien waivers. Let's make sure title says everything's okay, we'll give you the money. Mm. That's it. But by going to the site, you also see what's going on. Yeah. Sometimes you realize that the plumber and the electrician have an issue together. The developer might not even know that because right. he's not there all the time. Right. But if you're there and you have a relationship, it really goes a long way. Mm. And then the last thing I'll add is projects go sideways. Sometimes as yeah. a lender, you have to take back projects. Yeah. We don't want to. Right. 13 years, we've taken back only two assets. And we really try not to. We really try our hardest. We, we, we literally beg the borrower, help us help you to get out of this mess to okay. move on to the next So what deal. are you guys doing in that context? But if you were to take back yeah. an asset, now you've got all those relationships in all those cities because you've been visiting those sites. You know the contractors, you know the plumbers, you know the electric. Right. It's an easier transition. It's easier transition. They're not transition. fighting you this entire time. No. Yeah, exactly. So what, so what are those instances when you actually kind of solve those problems? Because if a product goes sideways, kind of a lot of times lenders, they don't think through, let's salvage this situation. Right. They're just thinking, all right, well, foreclosure it is. It goes back to getting greedy, right? right. And we've had this conversation internally a lot of people on our team sometimes they, they question me. They go, yeah. why, why, why are you trying to work this out? There's a ton of equity in this deal. Mm-hmm. We have the right as the lender to foreclose exactly. it. Exactly. I go, that's not the business we're in. We're in the business of recycling capital. Mm-hmm. We want to take, uh, we want to give money out. We want to get money back and and send it out. We don't want to take over projects. Right. And and we can talk about the humanitarian side of it. I used to be a developer. I used to be a contractor. Yeah. Nobody wants to lose their project. Yeah, and you lost they, that property with yeah, the bank. Yeah, I lost, yeah I, I lost it, and I was young. And, and we get that. And that's not the reason we don't foreclose. That's a part of being human. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, if you, the borrower, can exit this, and us, lender, can get paid back, we're not discounting our loans. Mm-hmm. We, want, we expect to get fully paid. Mm-hmm. And maybe we'll give you a little discount on the default interest or something to get us out of this mess that you're in. But we understand their pain. They're in a mess. This is, 
a lot of people, this is their life. Right. They, right? Or they, it's their Especially investor money. Especially the bigger money. deals. They've got a lot of money and time into they've it. They've got right? a lot of their own money in yeah. it. And then they've got investor money. They're answering to people. Yeah. The last thing they want to do is lose the asset. But what, what, what kind of things can you guys do besides just kind of on the loan terms itself, right? right. Are you guys getting down, down and dirty on the ground with them and like helping them kind of dig themselves out of the hole or? No. So, so we'll, we'll, give them, we'll give them time. Okay. Uh, we'll find them other lenders. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll do things that we'll, we'll see what it is they need. So we've so done, you're helping them on the capital stack. Right? On the capital stack, okay. yeah. We okay. we don't get into the construction okay. or, or anything like that. Because well, uh, the issue got I thought of it because like well if you're on the ground there like it could be easy for you to kind of have your construction manager insert himself like hey no 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 no, no do do these right, things right right but we don't want to do that but it's a conflict of interest it's a conflict it's a, it, yeah. we don't want to create a lender liability we've directed them to do certain things a certain smart, way smart. Yeah. okay understood understood I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. I wanted to take a brief moment to tell you about Jirasi, the nation's largest law firm dedicated to the private lending industry. We have three legal departments vertically integrated to serve a private lender's business. We handle everything from licensing to new entity formation, fund formation, loan documents, national compliance, litigation, bankruptcy, foreclosure, and so much more. We pride ourselves on giving our clients the ultimate peace of mind. Check us out at JirasiLawFirm.com. In addition, our internal conference line gives opportunities to you to network, learn from industry leaders, pitch to capital sources, and make new connections. Visit JirasiCon.com for more information about our upcoming events. That's G-E-R-A-C-I-C-O-N.com. Talk about when you're doing this. These, these deals are ground-up construction projects. You're right. building multifamily in, ver- in different, different locales. I mean, one of the things that I've always kind of scratched my head about is every city has different, I guess you can call it, local rules, not just in zoning and entitlements, but even on building apartments. Right. Like, it's just the fact that you're building housing, the city or the state inserts itself in various things. So, like, what are you guys doing to navigate that component, like the zoning and the and the permits and making sure everything's clear? Because sometimes the developer has no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that can be tough, right? Yeah. You're in all these different cities, different states around the country. Being a, a wise about those kind of issues And is they're tough. very different. Yeah. So we've got an existing deal in Nashville. Yeah. Had a subterranean garage. Uh, and our construction manager was doing the draw. Mm-hmm. And the borrower said, hey, uh, I don't need to do the wall in the subterranean ground. I don't need to do the wall because there's an exist there's existing rock, natural rock, mm-hmm. and that's going to be the structural engineering. Mm-hmm. We all kind of looked at each other and said, "What? That's imp- I've, I've never heard this." So you got a cave in your right. Garage. I've been in construction <laughs> 35 years. I've never heard Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've never heard how could a city allow this? Right. So we said, "We're going to suspend draws until this happens." He said, well, give me a little money. We said, okay, we'll give you a little bit, but we got to figure this out. Right. You're going to build this subterranean garage, and then you're going to build, and I don't remember, I think seven stories of multifamily on top, and there's no subterranean wall? How's this possible? So we, our construction manager went to the city, talked to the inspector, talked to building and safety, and how are you guys letting this happen? And they said, there's structural design. We've done the calcs. It works for us. So- it's a learning process. Right. I love learning something new every day. Right. My initial reaction was, there's no way. Right. We're full of it. I've, I've never heard of this. You're letting us build a back cave. Right, I mean, exactly. Like, yeah, what? You're, yeah. So you're going to drive down the driveway to park your car, and you're going to see natural rock in the background? Like, what? what? I get it from an architectural standpoint. It sounds cool. Oh, yeah, But yeah, it can't yeah. be structurally safe. No. But it was. So it's just you got to, you literally, when you say boots on the ground, you literally got to go into the city, mm. go into building and safety sometimes. It's time sensitive. And they have but, to learn the local, to learn, right. I guess, unique arrangements they have. Exactly. Right. And, and let me ask you about, the, about this component, because like a lot of times, well, at least in California, the advent of, uh, it adds a new layer to the capital stack. And I, we, you and I talk about this privately, is pace. In California, pace is a big factor, but now nationwide, yeah. these, I guess you can call them green components to the build. Right, and the the way buildings are being built are, is changing. You know, they're they're they're. I mean, I've heard of like modular housing. I've heard of prefab modular construction. I've heard of three D printing construction. Like, it, how do you guys keep? up? Are you guys allowing this stuff? And if you do, how do you keep up yeah. with this kind of trend? So we did a modular project in Truckee. Okay, uh, it's close to Reno. Yeah, 
I had never been there. Everybody right. kept telling me, go to Truckee, see what's going on right. there. And I'm like, well, first of all, the name's Truckee. Sounds right. so weird. Right. So I went up there. Right. Wow. Super high end. You know, Ritz Carlton, ski in, ski out. Right. Beautiful buildings. They're all modular. And I said, how do, how do we wrap our right. heads around? Head? So we went and we, our, our head of construction went and talked to the modular company. Mm. Figured out how they build the process. I looked at the finished project. Mm. I looked around. I could not see where the seam was where they put these buildings together. Mm. It was that well done. Mm. It was impressive. And we got comfortable with the fact that they're going to build this house, high-end. So these are $3 million homes in Truckee, in different pieces, in a different factory. Right. They're going to truck it over here, put it together. And we got comfortable because we got to know who the where the factory is, who the supplier is. We had them tag each one. So they're going to, they're tagged Parkview so they don't get lost. They don't get, because we're funding dollars towards that. Right. That's we your collateral. Make, yeah. That's our collateral in a different city that's not bolted down. <laughs> you yet. think about that. That's why I always had a problem with a question mark about modulars. Like the collateral, the improvement itself is being moved from one location to another. Right. It's not being built on site. Right. It, it, yeah, so the things we do is we tag it so it's our collateral. Yeah. We get a proper insurance for it for the for the trucking. Because what if something happens while yeah. it's on the road? Now it's damaged collateral. Right. So you gotta you gotta get all those pieces of the puzzle. It sounded much more complicated before we did it. Okay. And then like everything else in life, right? Now, you do it and you realize it's not that bad. Apartments, hotels, homes are being built in this much fashion. More. And now with 3D printing coming out, and it's right. just like you know, being a construction lender and keeping up with these new trends. You have to be able to pivot. It's crazy. The, 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 the newest trend for us post-COVID was this uh, repositioning of hospitality to multifamily. Oh, my. Conversions. We, right. We had never done it before. I'm not saying it didn't exist. Condo conversions were right. a huge deal. Right. We never did the hotel to multifamily. Right, right, right. Now right. we've done probably four or 500 million in the past 24 months. But you're like stripping rooms and, ins- and kind of Completely. combining rooms and installing new bathrooms and like it's- Complete. A lot of- so the first one we did was uh, also in Reno. It was the old Harris Casino. Uh-huh. I mean, main on main of Reno. Right. And they they bought three buildings, high rise buildings, mm-hmm. and they were converting into 500 multifamily units. And if you've ever looked into Reno, they built uh, you know a huge tech area there where yeah. Google and Slack and yeah, everybody's yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All these employees are working there. there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Nowhere to live. People were literally living housing. in their cars. They need so this was a great product. And a lot of people looked at this. We we closed the loan, you know, sent out a, a marketing blast. And people literally, other lenders that were colleagues, friends of mine, called me and said, What are you thinking doing a hundred million dollar deal in Reno? This is Reno. Yeah. And I said, if you know what's going on in Reno and you understand that they're taking a dilapidated hotel that nobody wants to stay in, they're gutting it. And they're taking that single room and making it a studio. Or they're taking two hotel rooms and making a one-bedroom unit. It's really not reinventing the wheel. It's actually really easy when you think about it. Mm. And they, But they're not thinking about it as a, as a builder. No. Right? right? They're looking at it from a lender's perspective. That's, the MSA doesn't look right. good to me. No, exactly. Right. It's Reno. Why would you do Reno? Right. That, you know, it's not a great MSA. But you're studying, the, you're studying the local demographics. We're looking at the demand. Yeah. We're looking at the literal demand of literally people sleeping in their cars. How did you, you guys get that intel? Because it's very hard to get that kind of on the ground level information. I think the only way is to go there. So I went there. I spent a day there. I met the borrower. Uh-huh. We had done another deal in Reno. He had so I knew. To you, I'm yeah. 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 And I, we had done a deal in Reno. So we knew about the issue of, mm-hmm. of the the demand and Mm -hmm. and the lack of multifamily, Mm -hmm. but just the fact that this borrower had the ability to convert hospitality to multifamily. And like you said, from a lender perspective, maybe it sounds a little dicey. From a construction perspective, simple. Right. And that opened up the ability for us to do multiple. We've done it in Colorado, Orlando. We did it in New York. We've done it everywhere. Especially in New York. They're doing a lot of that right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean- that actually raises an interesting point. It's like topics like in, in during so the, the a lot of us uh, I mean, on the show we talked a lot about disruption during during COVID in kind of the hard money resi space, but we didn't really talk about it for the commercial space. And you guys were you guys are builders. You, I mean, you guys are construction lenders. How did that impact you guys? Was it was it difficult? Was it a difficult time for you guys? COVID or? was scary. Yeah, you know, it was scary just because n- nobody knew what was happening. Right. Right. We don't and know what this is valued at anymore. With zero idea. Is the world <laughs> literally coming to so an like, end? Can yeah. they continue building? <laughs> yeah. How do you build, right? Uh, so we continued doing our construction draws uh-huh. because the last thing we wanted to do was ruin our reputation in sure. terms of not doing draws. Right. 
But we did stop originations for four months because we didn't know what to do. Uh, we actually look back on that mm -hmm. and we regret it. And that's why during this market, instability that's been happening the past 90 days, right. a lot of our colleagues have frozen. We haven't. We've Good. been lending like there's no difference. Right. And, and it's because of COVID. We learned our lesson. We mm -hmm. learned our lesson that things will change. Markets will change. Markets will disrupt. There will be a new normal. As long as you're lending to your fundamentals, as long as you're sticking to what you know and what you understand and you're not getting greedy, it'll be fine. You'll right. work through these ups and downs. So COVID was tough because we were still doing construction draws right. all over but the were nation. You, were your builders Our able builders to... were still building, okay, believe it or not. There was a couple times, like we had a deal in Portland where they actually, the city shut them down for three That's weeks. That's crazy. Yeah, there were a couple of those incidents, right. but surprisingly, Construction actually proceeded better than any other industry. We were actually pleasantly surprised here in LA, at least, that that it didn't cease. No, I think they were. That was the one area they were willing to kind of let go. Yeah, because we need housing. <laughs> well, I mean, look at it from different facets, right? From from a buyer's perspective, right. we need the housing, right? Yeah. From our perspective, and then you look at from the the people that are on the ground, the workers that they need are there, to work. They need the work. Yeah. They're not going to make it till Friday if they don't work. Right. So shutting down a construction site has ramifications way beyond right. COVID right. or the industry. You're talking about people that rely on that paycheck right. every Friday. So everybody was incentivized to keep on working. Right. And we were incentivized to keep on funding. And, mm. you know, we, we talked to our bank and we said, what's going on? Right. And they said, we don't know. What do you think? We said, we don't know what's going on either. I mean, right. this is March of 2020. And we asked the question point blank. Are you going to stop giving us money? Because right. we're going to keep on giving money oh. to our borrowers. Uh -huh. And they said, no, we have a great relationship with you. Keep going. That was also another pleasant surprise for a lot of our lenders was that the, the, the warehouse lenders out there, the banks, they understood, they, they understood, hey, well, even if the values dip to a lot, we're, we're protected. Right. And the lenders that we're working with have sound underwriting guidelines because they qualify for our lines. They're protected. So what are we worried about? Right. And I didn't see a lot of, we, like, when March hit, yeah. we were, like, Anthony and I were like, uh-oh, is it margin call time? Is it margin yeah, call time? Right. And, and thankfully, all of the true warehouse lenders didn't do a single margin call. Right. The big ones had had all kinds of weird provisions in them. Some of them got called, but the, the, the kind of the industry standard, you know, the, our, some of our friends out there, we just interviewed on the show, I won't name names, they didn't call. And that was great. And yeah. They worked with their clients, all, all shapes and sizes. I remember being on a lot of phone calls and it was, and, just, you know, even if we had defaults, we were, okay, well, let's figure this out. Right. And that was nice. That was very nice. It, it, it saved a lot of our clients from freaking out on their end because there was a, their borrowers were freaking out. Their staff were freaking out. Like. Last thing they need is their bank freaking out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the last thing you need. Right. And you know, the, the reality is the banks are the best protected right. entities in this whole process. Right. The developers are at risk. They're the ones then us as risk. lenders have some risk. And then the banks that are giving us money, they're, right. they're at 30% they're at LTV. Right. They've right. got nothing to worry right. about. Right, 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 right. So, so let's talk about today now. So. The market is a little bit weird. We had that was before we started the show. It's like the market's a little bit weird. Yeah. Rates are somewhat up. It feels like not too bad. I feel like they're back to kind of like 2010, 11 rates. They're not skyrocketing just yet. No, but it is causing a pretty significant disruption. How are how is it causing? How, how has it disrupted you guys? How are you guys reacting to it? Yeah, you good. Know? Great, great uh, question. So we've been talking about a recession for years. Yeah, <laughs> we talk about it internally all the time because we're always concerned about how is it going to play out. Mm -hmm. The one thing I know, be, gone through five recessions, is that no recession looks like the last one. Nope. And you can never predict what's going to cause the next recession. So when we looked at this a year ago, and, and we uh, people were talking about, oh, inflation being transitory or not transitory, or what's going on. That was already on. a year ago. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody thought about this super quick rate in hikes. Yeah. Everybody thought, like we talked about, it, it's going to be a low interest rate a scenario. Mm. Uh, and on from a personal standpoint, I'll tell you, I bought an asset mm -hmm. earlier this year, and I got a variable rate mm -hmm. because I believe rates were going to be low. And now my rate's going up. So right. you live with it. But what, what have we done? So we started saying internally in January that the recession's here mm. and it's coming. And Q1 in number- January. January. 
So when Q1 numbers came out and there was a dip in GDP, yeah, 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 we yeah, said, yeah, yeah. guys, we're here. And everyone said, no, that we're not here. It was a small dip, though. It wasn't even it was like, a small dip. It was notable. It was a small you dip. the call in January. But at though. the same time, and, and you, you know, we have quarterly reports that we yeah. sent to our investors where we started telegraphing, guys, we're seeing Smart. issues. Right. So it goes back to what do you do, right? If there's going to be issues, we're, we're lenders. We're not on the equity side. Right. We're already protected, right? We're, if we're at 60, 65% LTV, even 70%, we've got a big cushion. Right. So the things we, we always do is stick to your fundamentals, underwrite properly, originate properly, don't get greedy with deals. Mm. But what do you do now? Now we're looking at cap rates. Mm. So we got compressed with cap rates. I remember when multifamily traded at a seven cap. Yeah. A lot of people here are too young to remember that. But now we were getting pushed to doing deals at a three and a half, four cap. And I said, those days are over. Mm. Our minimum cap rate, exit cap rate is four and a half. I even think that's aggressive. In some markets, you've got to be at five, five and a half, six. You do not want to look at this deal in two years and say, why were we writing it at a four cap when interest rates were going up? So that's the first thing we did is let, let's increase our cap rates. So you guys, are, you guys are setting the cap rate for the exit and, and underwriting to that cap rate. Exactly. But let's talk about what, where things are currently at because they're not following, they're not tracking where we thought they'd be tracking. That's true. Cap rates haven't gone up yet. It's strange. Yeah. And it, well, if you look at it historically, cap rates and interest rates don't always correlate mm. together. Naturally, we think they do. Logically, you think they do. Right. They have to. Capitalization rate. Right. <laughs> if the U.S. Treasury is at 3.5, why would I buy a real estate asset at 3.5? It, it just doesn't make sense. Right. But eventually, it, it creeps up. So mm. our concern is maybe it won't for a while. There's a lot of money in the marketplace. There's people that have to put that money to work. Mm -hmm. So people will still buy things at a low cap rate, especially 100 unit, 200 unit, 400 unit assets mm -hmm. that are institutional in quality. Mm. But we're just concerned that over time, if the Fed fund rate keeps going up, right, we're at 2.75, they're saying maybe by the end of the year, we're at 4.25. Can you legitimately say you're going to buy a four cap property when the Fed fund rate is 4.25? Right. It's hard. So we're assuming even if it doesn't go up today, it, it will, will go, go up. up with time. And if it doesn't go up, all we are is at a lower LTV. And maybe we lost a few deals here or there. But remember the business we're in. We're in preservation of wealth. Right. All we want to do is preserve our investors' wealth, right. recycle the capital, and go to the next deal. If we close less loans, we close less loans, but we don't mm. want to close loans and take them back. Right. You'd rather be, yeah, that makes sense. What's 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 tricky in today's market is is that there's a still a lot of activity. A lot. And there's a lot of lenders that are still through, the, like basically doing what they've been doing. I haven't really changed the model. Yeah. Uh, even though a lot of the institutional guys have pulled out, it's it's kind of dried up a little bit, but they're still in finding ways to get their deals done. And raises the question for you, like how often has your, has your no rate increased in the past, past I guess, call it six months now? It has, uh, yeah. naturally. So we use SOFR as an index yeah. and we have a spread over SOFR. Yeah. When SOFR was 0.28, believe it or not, five months ago, mm -hmm. if we're if we're SOFR plus 700 or SOFR plus 800, you're looking at eight and a half percent interest rate. Now SOFR's at 2.4%. So you're talking at 10.5%. So even if we don't change our spread, the index alone has, has, has taken yeah, up. Yeah, but we yeah. also took our spread up. Yeah. So when markets started got, getting a little volatile about 90, 120 days ago, we said, guys, there's less people lending out there. We're a known product. We're, we have a certainty of execution. Right. We're going to get it done. We have the ability to charge a little bit more. Because our investors are going to expect a little bit more. They're going right. to say, hey, there's more risk right now than there was a year ago. Right. If you want me to keep my money in your fund, we, we're expecting a higher yield. Yeah, but I mean, that's, I, I feel like our audience on the lending side are so nervous about rate increases and rate increases. Like, oh man, I'm so screwed. My rates are going to have to go up. Yeah. I'm so nervous about telling my borrowers about rates going up. But I have a lot of real estate clients who develop, and I ask them, I always ask them, are you worried about that? Like, man, I've been waiting for this to happen for a while. Yeah. I knew it's coming. I, I've known it's coming. I, I've been ready for it. We write, we write to it expecting a higher rate. Right. And it's kind of one of the disconnects, I feel like, lenders and builders. They don't, lenders are worried that they're going to freak out. But the builders are always like, yeah, I knew it was coming. Yeah. 
surprised well, you asked me this late. <laughs> it's, it, it's the brokers in between, right? The brokers uh, want to get the best deal. Yeah. And they tell lenders, we didn't go with you. We went le- with lender B because his rate was cheap. Right. And the more you say this, the more it gets ingrained in mm-hmm. lenders' heads. And so our origination team, they're so rate sensitive. And mm-hmm. we tell them, guys, relax. Right. Just, we want to do the right deals. And like you said, how long are we married to these bars? 18 months, 24 months? So they pay 2% more, 300 basis points. It's not going to kill your deal. Yeah. You, you want to get the deal done. Right. You want to have draws go quickly. You rather go with a lender, pay a little bit more, but get that project done and built and sold or mm. refinance sooner. You go with another lender or with a bank where it takes 30 days to do a draw. <coughs> that's now what? the other thing that's been really, I guess, kind of fascinating to me. Banks jumped head, jumped back in head first into construction lending. Like the banks that I used to work for, I used to work for Wilshire State, now now Bank of Hope. And back then, I did I worked there after college. It was in, in the early two thousands. The construction lending was all they did back then, and yeah. they stopped. But now they're back in, right? But they're still really, really strange in their approach. I, I don't understand the approach because every lender that I know who does construction loans. They're beating them out every time. And now I'm hearing about these banks doing like AB financing and like all kinds of weird yeah, structures because yeah. they're missing out on the deals. Yeah. Like how, how much has the, has the banking industry just uh, caused any stress for you guys? Has it caused any disruption for it you guys? It hasn't caused stress. It's actually an, it creates opportunity okay. because they make their process so difficult. They have global cash flow. They have yeah. documents. They have tax returns. We say don't send us that. We don't want to see our tax right, return. Right, 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 We're right, looking right, at the right. asset. Right. We look at the borrower. Right. Does the deal make sense? The banks make it so difficult before they close the loan. Yeah. And then after they close the loan, their draw process, it's like pulling teeth. It takes three, and for it us, takes it's like- Almost a month. Yeah, go to yeah. the site. Did they do the work? Give them the money. Yeah. We want to give them the money because we're right. charging interest when <laughs> right, we give right, them the money. Right, 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 right. That's created opportunities. And now, yeah, they want to do all this A, B structure because now they're super safe, right? Yeah. The, the private lenders in the B spot, the banks in the A spot- We've done a few of those here or there. We don't love it just because, again, it's leverage. Right. So you have and a warehouse line, you too. have this. And yeah, you, you just you, you want to make it as simple as possible. Mm. So we try to avoid that. But we did a bridge loan on office in Stamford, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. It was 550,000 square feet mm-hmm. of office with credit tenants, Deloitte, Hankel, McDonald's. Mm-hmm. Great tenants. Yeah, It was $110 million. We didn't want $110 million sitting. So we did a... Uh, an AB note on that, juiced our returns, got low, you know, 50% financing, more than enough cash flow from an existing product, a bridge product to pay for it. So a situation like that, is the okay. Bank, is the bank inserting themselves too much on that? In that Not at all. No. They, they, that's the key. Right? That's the key, right? Yeah. We told them, hey, guys, you're going to give us money. We're going to give you a coupon. That's it. Mm-hmm. You don't get involved with, but it's also, again, credit tenants, they're paying their rent on time. Right. There are it's no a home issues. run deal. Yeah, it's, it's a, a home, home run, run deal. deal. That's and, that's where I think an AB makes so it's, sense. It's basically a bank loan, but the banks the banks can't win the bid. Right. And so you guys are stepping in and working basically, kind of participating with the bank, making right. them happy. They can they can uh, avoid the credit risk because they can just do lender financing now. And they're lower leverage, right? right. We're at 110 million. They're at 55. And then now they're OCC compliant. They're not over leveraged. Exactly. Uh, all that. Smart. All those reserves and all those issues that they have, right, from a regulatory standpoint that we don't have. They can hit it with right, the AB. Right, right, And because it's no construction, it's easy. When you yeah. do a construction loan with an AB, oh, my God. Yeah. We've done it. We've done a couple of them. And they, and they have questions. It's like, why are you asking so many questions? Mm-hmm. Right? You're in the A position. You let us. Right. We're in the B. You I want like 30% LTV right. or you're, something you're, like you're, that. You're, exactly. 30% LTV and you're worried about stuff that we're not worried and about. And you're getting so. first laws because you're B. So exactly. it's like you're taking, up, you're taking out the property. Exactly. Anything. So, yeah, that's been the kind of head scratcher for me because when I saw my old bank jump back into construction lending, I was just like, the fact that you guys are back in, I know how you used to be operate and that not going to fly today. Right. And. And the, you know, I mean, notably, that bank built a lot of the buildings in Koreatown, but like they can't keep up now. Yeah. And they're realizing it. And so it's, but it's been really interesting to see them jump back into the space over the past like five ish years and try to, try to, because I, I see them. I see like, you know, Mitsubishi and I see some of these Korean banks and some of the SBA banks come to the events. I'm like, you guys, you guys are better off just offering lender financing. Yeah. Right? But they don't want to do it. They want to win the bid. Yeah. And it's been interesting to see them kind of flounder in this new market. That's been kind of created over the past, I guess, 10, 15 years now. So. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. 
Park View Financial, we talked about up, up until now. Yeah. Uh, a lot of folks don't know that much about Paul, right? <laughs> so, like, you were a builder, right? But like, you're local, or, or yeah. always Cal- California guy. I always lived in LA my entire life. Okay, I travel a lot for work, right? And people say, "How do you like living in LA?" The first few times I thought about it, and then I realized I don't know any different. Right. I've traveled a lot, right, 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 internationally, right. domestically, but I've always lived you in lived LA. Here in LA, so I've only known LA. Went to college here in LA. I, I went to UCLA for undergrad, USC for graduate oh, man, school. You never left. No, <laughs> and, now, and now I have twin boys that are seniors in high school, and I tell them, "You are leaving." Because yeah. you got to do what I didn't do. So they're not going to follow in dad's footsteps no, and be a Bruin? I no, I, I hope not. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. But uh, it, you need to get out. You yeah. need to live other places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I love L.A. It's it's a great place to live. I mean, you're pretty well known in the private lending community here in L.A. I mean, yeah. everyone knows Paul. Yeah. Everyone knows Parkview. It's been nice. And you're a local guy. Everyone knows that. And I remember I, w- I did not expect this. I, I went to like a local charity event here in L.A. And you were there a couple years back. <laughs> right. The Jewish home event. I was like, I was like. Every client is here. <laughs> it was really weird. But um, the, the, the interesting part about like this L.A. community is there's so many private lenders now right. here in L.A. And a lot of them have kind of are new, right? And have, have, any, have you mentored any of the new lenders here in L.A. and given them some pointers that kind of come to you? You know, we, a lot of us know each other, right? right? And, and I, I've had lenders mentor me when I started. Right. And I've talked to people that are starting. And it's always good to talk about these things. Right. I, I don't look at people as competition. Right. There is so much demand out there for our right. product right, right, that right. we can lend 4X of what we lend and there's still enough. Right. Like I told you, nine to 10,000 loan requests Right, you can't do every single one of them. So I, I, oh, I my doors are always open. Mm. Anytime somebody wants to come in, we'll go to lunch and talk about, hey, how'd you do it? What do, what do you do differently? Mm. I, I mean, I in this conversation, I told you everything that some people think it's our secret sauce. No. This is the way we lend. This is the way we do construction. This is the way we right. underwrite. I don't think there's secrets here. Right. I think you just do the right thing. You don't get greedy. You play it safe and you'll be fine. It's a mentality of abundancy. That's yeah, important. Yeah. It is. It yeah, really yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Right. And you know, it's interesting. I One of the things that's interesting about Parkview is that I actually love what I do. Mm. And when I was a builder, I hated it. Mm. But I did it because that was my job. That's right. how I made money. That's right. how I put food on the table. Mm. And I remember when I was a builder, somebody once talked about working and doing something they loved. And I thought they were crazy. I'm like, that's impossible. That's, your job, right? yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a fantasy. Right, like, how right, could right, you right, possibly right. love what you do? Right. And now I realize it's actually possible. And it mm. makes it so much easier. Because as a group, we laugh together. We joke mm. together. We, we do various things, but we go to lunch every time it's somebody's birthday, mm. all of us. Mm. And we make sure it's a Friday and we leave at one o'clock and we go home at like five or six. Nice. And we try to Uber because right. we're eating and we're drinking <laughs> yeah. and we're having fun. And we literally have fun. And sometimes people bring up work and somebody else goes, no, we're not talking about work. Nice. You know, and, and so we really do have fun. And I enjoy it. Right. Because there is no formula right, and there right, is no right, milestone, right, right, like right. I said at the beginning. So I met I met Jamie Simonoff, the CEO and creator of Ring, mm-hmm. a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And he told me something that always stuck with me. He said, when I started Ring, people would tell me, what's the goal? Mm. And I said, there is no goal. Mm. We're building out a platform and we're enjoying it while we do it. Mm. And it resonated with me because it, it Parkview is the same way. Mm. We've never tried to hit a milestone. We've never tried to hit a target. Mm. We've never tried to say we're going to sell. We've always said, let's just grow slowly, organically. Mm. And he even said, he said, somebody told me at $100 million, sell. And I said, why? He said, you're at $100 million. And he said, Hmm. but why is that the number? Right. Right. And eventually he sold to Amazon at a billion dollars, which is crazy for considering it's it's not a proprietary no uh, the product, right? No. Anybody could make right. a ring. But I think that the the lesson there is if you target yourself to hit a certain milestone or get to a certain thing, mm. it cha- takes away from the dynamic. So we have a dynamic here in our team where it's all about enjoy the process, do the right thing, recycle the money, mm. get the money out, bring the money back, preserve wealth. And that's why we keep increasing our investor base. We keep increasing our origination base. We don't get greedy. We do the right things. I think it's so important because a lot of people kind of have, have and this is the problem when you talk about institutionalization of the space is that you see a lot of people with that kind of mentality. Like, yeah. is, you know, we have to have KPIs. We have to have, you know, we have to sell the company and all these kind of like, you know, I guess you can call it corporate America things. But 
what I'm hearing is that you're still maintaining, it's not a startup mentality. I, I almost like to hear, I mean, I'm hearing more of like a family business mentality. Yeah, and I really that's like exactly that. it. Yeah, and I really like that because it's like Jirasi is still very much a family business, and I don't think we ever want to. Like, we had offers to be bought by big law firms. Oh, right? I'm sure. absolutely not. Yeah, because then we can't do what we want to do. Right. Right. And so, that's that's one of the that's one of the things that allured people to Jirasi is that is that I hope it so. was cre- you know it was created with this idea of this family business, and you guys all know each other, and you guys all hang out with each other. Right. Oh, too much. <laughs> <laughs> but that's but that's what makes it great, right? Exactly. Yeah? Exactly. No, we, exactly. Have, we have people on our team that hang out outside of the office and on the right. weekends. They go work out together and they travel together and they they, they right. hang out together with their significant others or alone. Right. That's amazing, right? That's a, that's, to, to have that ability. Right. That and it only happens when you don't have that big corporate mentality right. of where are we getting next? Right. Where are we getting next? We're getting to next week. We're getting to next month. Mm. Yeah, we want to hit certain targets per quarter. Hey, right. because we got to make sure we close enough loans. And but we, if you love what you're but, doing at the same time, it's going to naturally come. It's natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, we got to get into rapid fire questions now. So these sure. are the these are the fun questions. So first of all, first question we always ask: What was your very first job? And it, was it a, were you, was it a, being a builder? Well, it depends uh, what age. So at the age I'm of ten, my very first job. Yeah, 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 yeah At yeah, the yeah, age yeah. of ten, I was living in a condo project with my parents, five condos, and I was the one who had to uh, collect the mail and clean up for the other units. And and my mother still jokes about this. But she said that, and I don't remember it as well as she does, mm-hmm. but she said somehow I got our housekeeper to do the work and paid the housekeeper and collected the money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's true. I'm just, I'm just repeating what she said. So that's the first job at the age of 10. But then the first real job, yeah, I, I started with my father at the age of 17, mm-hmm. started building projects. Mm. And, and that's how I learned construction. You don't learn construction in, in school. Right. But I did. I went. I, I still went to school. I got a graduate degree. But it was always going to be, I'm going to be in the family business. Oh, that's great. And my father tried to talk me out of it. I finished really? law school. And he said, why would you want to do construction? Right. It's dirt and nails and wood and it's disgusting. Right. Go work in the ivory tower. Yeah. yeah. Go, yeah, go, yeah. go wear your suit and do. And I right. said, because working in a family environment, you grow together. Mm. And it's very different than, again, it goes back to that corporate discussion, right? Why would I want to be in a law firm mm. where I'm wearing a suit and tie in a big high rise building? Right. So I forgot to bring this up. People, people I, I forgot about that. You went yeah. to USC law. Yeah, exactly. But, but you never, you never practiced a day in your life. You, you always. I, I got an active license. Yeah, I but you jumped into the real estate immediately, right away. Right. Immediately, and I handled our own cases, right. our disputes, I right. should say, for about twelve months, and I said no. This it's sucks. either you. <laughs> yeah, well, it does suck. <laughs> Spoken like a true lawyer. It, Either you're a lawyer or you're a businessman. You right. can't do your own stuff, right? right so right, right, I right, quickly right. got out of it and, and started farming it out. But right. Yeah, and, and then I had close friends that said, if you're going to go into construction and building, why'd you go to USC? Right. <laughs> like, you could have go, gone anywhere. But. Right. No, I mean, there's, there's, I see a lot of folks in LA, like they do it because, you know, the education component has, it's more of a, I think it's a family thing. Like, oh, yeah. You, right? you learn so much. Right. You they learn a different way degree. of thinking. Yeah, right. it's a, it's, right. you. you you, you get that critical thinking that right. you really you don't, need. You're not going to get that just by working. So you have, you know, the education component. My, my family was the same way. Like, you, you can go be a banker if you want, but go go get your advanced degree first and then go back into the world. So exactly. I ended up becoming a lawyer. I mean, <laughs> but. <laughs> but, you don't, but you don't look like a lawyer. <laughs> Thank you. That was the goal the That's entire time. <laughs> All right, next question. What is one business tool that you cannot live without? Business tool. Business tool. It can be any tool that you use, but it's a business tool. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you define this as a business tool, but one of the things we, I use, mm. and I've tried to instill in our team is fairness. Okay. So I've got this gut check of fairness. Mm-hmm. When somebody's being unfair with me, it mm-hmm. immediately, I feel it. Mm-hmm. And I always say, make sure you're being fair to the other side. It mm-hmm. doesn't mean you don't want to do well. Right. You don't want to make money or you don't want to do X, Y, Z. You don't want to protect your remedies and your mm-hmm. rights. As a lender, but be fair. If mm. there's something you can do that's fair, mm. either before closing, during the construction process, or even during the takeout mm. process, be fair. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So when when you aren't, the question is now, when you aren't dominating the construction lending world, <laughs> what does Paul do in his spare time? What are you doing in your spare time? Um, 
So I, I like to I like to bike. I like to hike. I like to play tennis. Okay. Uh, I really, really enjoy being with friends and family. Mm. So whether that's traveling or in LA, where you're around a table and you're having good food and good cocktails that's the best. and just laughing. That's the best. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always think laughter's the right, best, right, 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 right. best medicine. Right. I joke around a lot. We actually joke around a lot in our office to the point where we say, guys, we, we're joking too much. Right. <laughs> Let's make sure we don't cross any lines in oh, today's oh, yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's life is about enjoying the journey. Mm. There is no destination because we never know mm. what's, what tomorrow is or what next month holds or next year holds. So you got to enjoy that destination. But to me, doing it with family and friends and our team, mm -hmm. I think you enjoy it more than ever. Mm. And we're we're planning a, we're planning a company wide retreat oh, in yeah. Nashville this year. Oh yeah. wow! We we purposely That's a long trip. It is, but we purposely want it. We want to pick a city. Yeah. That all the different offices come to because we right. have an office in New York, we have an office in Atlanta and L.A. Okay. And then we decided we need to make it a neutral city mm. because if you pick a if you pick a location in Atlanta, for example, people in Atlanta go home. Yeah, locals. And then yeah, we said, yeah. let's pick a fun city. Yeah. So we've we we've, we've picked a fun city. We've got great speakers coming. We have oh. a, an itinerary with dinners and drinks. I think that's part of the process of enjoying enjoying it. I mean, that not, so it's it's not just a means for your national team to bond, but you're actually doing a company retreat. So you're you're preparing for the following year. Yeah, exactly. That's so cool. And we'll that's talk so cool. about hey what. Just like the stuff we right. just talked about. That's so cool. I don't think I know many companies actually do the, a, a full-on company retreat like that, yeah. off-site like that. That's yeah, cool. we're excited. It's going to be- uh, The first time you guys done it? or is Three it? nights. Three yeah, nights? three nights and two full days. Wow. Yeah, first time we're doing it. Yeah. That's great. We've had holiday parties, but sure. this is, you need that time away, right? right? Where you wake up in a hotel and you have breakfast and you, you listen to a speaker for an hour and you're like, wow. And they're, and they're not necessarily, none of them are lender, lending mm. speakers, right? Like they're different speakers of- One's a nutritionist. Mm. Hey, how, how do you make your lifestyle healthier, mm. right? Because we talk about it a lot here, work-life balance. Mm. How do you make sure that, you know, we work really hard. You mm. can tell by what we do and how we originate right. and what we've produced. But we want to love our life mm. as well, whether it's on the weekends or on the weekdays. Right. How do you incorporate that? So it's important. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, I mean, I... That's actually really fast because I've been wanting to do one of those for our firm forever. Yeah, it's just it's really hard to figure out how we do that for the whole. Like we have guys in New York, we've got a guy in Florida. Yeah, how yeah, do you yeah. do the whole company right and get them all to that neutral location? It's kind of kind of key thing. That's, that's the key. That's, so you just gotta. So our our marketing director, she's based in New York, mm -hmm. and you should talk to her. She's she's taken the, the lead on the whole thing, right? Mm. I I helped her pick the city. But she found flights for everyone, mm. right? And we told everybody from the minute you get on that flight, everything's paid for for mm. you. So your flight, your hotel, your Uber, your meals, everything. And and literally all, all they got to do is show up. And she's she's doing everything. She actually flew from New York to Nashville just to check out the locations because she was trying to pick some locations. I said, you can't do it. All. It's like real estate. Yeah. You got to go there. And yeah, she, yeah. she goes, wow. She went there. She she. Pick the, a great hotel, restaurants, bars, you know, and but it's just that getaway, right? It's, right. We all travel. Right. And when you travel and you come back, sometimes you forget about things that you talked about the week before yeah. because you were able to turn it off for two days. Right. So I think turning it off for two days, but also being with your team mm -hmm. and meeting people from different cities that you see on the Zoom every yeah. week, but you don't really connect. And you see them at the holiday party once a year for three hours and you have a you have cheers with the champagne. You need more than that. Right. You need something where there's a team building experience. Right, 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 right. All right. Well, so the last kind of question I want to ask is like, what are you excited about for the next few years? What are you excited about? You know, I'm excited to see what's the next step. Yeah. So people ask me, did you ever think when you started Parkview in 2009, you'd be where you are today? Right, right, right. Hell no. <laughs> when we started in 2009, my father's words were, hey, why don't we lend for 18 months uh, while the market uh, corrects itself, and mm. then we'll jump back into development. Guess what? We never went back to development. Mm. And it's been such a great run. And every step of the way, we've grown. Mm -hmm. And we've surpassed our own expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, 2020, we originated 600 million in originations on a, in a COVID year. Mm -hmm. And that was our record. And mm. then last year, we hit 1.2 billion. That's but we awesome. never hit a, we never tried to hit a number. Mm -hmm. We just said, let's close loans. Right. 
and let's raise money. And as you raise money, it gives you ability to close more loans. Right. And, and as long as you're doing the right thing and that money's recycling and coming back and the investors are getting a yield and they're not seeing defaults build up, mm -hmm. you'll continue. Right. And who knows what's the next step, but I, I'm just excited to go through the process, go through the journey mm -hmm. and just experience it. It's been a great run so far and we've enjoyed every minute well, of it. Well, it's going to keep going. It sounds yeah. like it's me. I mean, there's no reason to stop, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, I think that's all the time we have for this episode of Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. Paul, I want to thank you for coming out. Thank uh, you. Having us in your office. Yeah, of course. And, do, and this beautiful office and having this interview. I love doing these on site. So uh, this episode is going to come out pretty soon. Uh, we'll see you at the next conference somehow, some way. For sure. I'll have drinks then. Thanks for watching this episode. Tune in for the next episode. This is Kevin Kim signing off. Thanks for listening to Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. If you did enjoy, please leave us a five-star review on your podcast platform. And be sure to follow our show to be notified of new episodes. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to smash that like button and hit subscribe for more content from all of us here at Jirasi. Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim is available on all podcast platforms. Referrals really help us spread the word. So please send this over to someone you think might enjoy it. See you next time. This is Kevin Kim signing off.